It's almost impossible to introduce someone who's a really a heroic figure in the intellectual life, um, in economics, in philosophy, and just in the pursuit of social justice in, in the world. Um, I think I'll start by talking about Sen's uh, upbringing in Shantaniketan, where he, he uh, grew up with a father who was an expert in Hindu religion, who wrote the Penguin Introduction to Hinduism, to which uh, Omoto has contributed an introduction and an editing job. Uh, his mother was one of Tagore's leading dancers in his musical extravaganzas in his experimental school. And in fact, the name Amartya was coined by Tagore, who thought that Immortal One is a good name for a young boy to have. And uh, so, so the, growing up in this very rich, uh, nurturing, but also humanistic and uh, arts-filled environment, I think it was, very, it was a very important thing to draw attention to, because the kind of education that that school provides is uh, increasingly in, in short supply in the world. Um, he went from there to Presidency College in Calcutta, uh, and then on to Cambridge University, where he, he had uh, the famous Joan Robinson as his uh, thesis advisor, and his thesis was the monograph Choice of Techniques, his, his first book. Uh, after that, he taught at, at both Jodhpur University in Calcutta and the Delhi School of Economics, but then um, went on various visits to the US at both MIT and, and Stanford, uh, but then taught for a long period as a professor of economics in, at Oxford University, and then moved to, to Harvard University, where he still is the Lamont University professor. However, in the middle, he was also master of Trinity College, Cambridge, between 19, uh, what, 1994 and, uh, oh, wait a minute, I've, I've written this down someplace, but I've got the date. So what are your dates for the Trinity? 98 to 2004, yeah. And uh, then, also 98, and the program is wrong about this, I think the program awarded you the Nobel Prize 10 years earlier than you actually got it. Uh, also 98, he, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. And the following year, equally important award, the Bharat Ratna Award, the highest uh, civilian award uh, awarded by the Indian government. Um, he's still a passionate uh, citizen of India, as well as uh, uh, living in the US and, and being very involved in, in British affairs as well. There are just three features of, of Omoto's work that I want to mention, which you have all seen in, in reading his work, which, which you'll see today. Uh, first, it's technical brilliance. Uh, that, that's just uh, beyond question, and I think it's a large part of what made it possible for him to address these foundational issues of, of justice and, and get the hearing of the economics profession but the second is its uh, determination to pursue foundational questions and to do that in a way that one might say is interdisciplinary, although as, as he's always stressed, the, the economics used to have that a, as an internal part of itself. And that is to address the foundational philosophical questions about justice uh, that, that uh, are so crucial to, to thinking about economic problems. And uh, then finally, just the passionate concern for how people live and for justice in real human lives. You see this especially in his new book on justice. Um, but I think that's what motivates and informs really everything else uh, about his work. And it's what really motivates the pursuit of the capabilities approach, which really does say that the central question uh, for development should be, what is each person actually able to do and to be? So um, he's going to speak to us today on capabilities and justice. So please welcome Professor Amartya Sen. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be back here. And I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting, um, Jim and Martha for their kindness of inviting me, and Martha for the very kind and over generous, but uh, I won't complain about that <laughs> introduction. Um, actually, even though I see revealed that my name is meant to be immortal, uh, mean immortal, I recognize that the need for replacement has come, and I'm gradually trying to replace bit by bit. I've got metal knees, and I've just replaced my uh, 
lenses in the, in the eyes. So at the moment there's nothing here. Uh, so that's still recovering. But I don't think... E reading is not always entirely easy, but I think it may be slightly better with the middle distance vision for reasons that may or may not be clear. <laughs> I tried to argue in a recent book, The Idea of Justice, that our understanding of the idea of justice and its conceptual as well as practical implications demands some fairly radical departures from the mainstream theories of justice that are dominant at the present time. The ongoing philosophy of justice is too strongly dependent on a particular way of thinking that, uh, that was largely initiated by Thomas Hobbes in the 17th century and which concentrates on identifying perfectly just social arrangement and take the characterization of just institutions, quote unquote, to be the principal and often the only identified task of the theory of justice. This way of seeing justice is woven in different ways around the idea of a hypothetical social contract, an imagined contract that the population of a sovereign state is supposed to be a party to. Major contributions were made in this line of thinking by Hobbes in the 17th century, as I mentioned, and later by John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Emmanuel Kant, among others. The contractarian approach has become the dominant influence in contemporary political philosophy, led by the most prominent, and I believe the finest political philosopher of our time, John Rawls, whose classic book, A Theory of Justice, published in 1971, presents a definitive statement on the social contract approach to justice. But it also applies to other theories of justice that are uh, quite powerfully presented these days uh, in, in, the, in, the, in modern political philosophy, Ronald Dworkin, Robert Nozick, David Gauthier, and so on, even though they disagree with each other, they shared that feature. Some of these points I did try to say in the morning in the class, and I recognize this is a larger group than, than, the, than, the, than, the, than uh, that were, I said their class, but I didn't mean class, of course. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the seminar that was going on. Uh, so I will, uh, some people might be slightly bored since uh, for the first three minutes there was a lot of overlap with what I said before in the morning. In contrast, a number of other Enlightenment theorists, Adam Smith, Marquis de Condorcet, Mary Wollstonecraft in the 18th century, Karl Marx, John Stuart Mill in the 19th, uh, and others, took a variety of approaches that differed in many ways from each other, but shared a common interest in making comparisons between different ways in which people's lives may go, jointly influenced by the working of institutions, but not just institutions, people's actual behavior, their social interactions, and other factors that significantly impact on what actually happens. The analytical and rather mathematical discipline of social choice theory um, which had its origin in the same period in the works of the French mathematicians in the 18th century, in particular Condorcet, but also others like Borda, offers, I argue in the book, a, a richer and I think in some ways a more useful approach to thinking about the idea of justice. In the book I've discussed how the approach of social choice theory um, can help the pursuit of public reasoning aimed at the removal of diagnosable injustice in the actual world in which we live. And by social choice theory, I don't mean only social choice theory, in the narrow sense also what is called public choice theory, particularly the work of James Buchanan is, is, a, is a major part, I think, of that heritage. The task of the theory of justice in this approach is not that of speculating and dreaming about a perfectly just world, or even about perfectly just institutions, but using public scrutiny to arrive at agreed diagnosis of manifest injustices on the elimination of which a reasoned agreement could emerge. If our con concentration has to be on the actual lives of people, the question that immediately arises is how to understand the richness and poverty of human lives. The capability approach, which is part of the theme of this conference, focuses on the freedoms that people actually enjoy. It's useful to begin by discussing why is this approach distinctive. 
The focus on of freedom, uh, the focus on freedoms and capabilities differs sharply from many other approaches to assess, assessing the demands of justice. For example, as with institutional libertarianism, looking for the fulfillment of certain formal rights that people should have, uh, whether or not these rights can be actually exercised in a way that would have an impact on the lives of these people. Many of these rights can, of course, have an important instrumental role in advancing more free social life that's not denied. But the pursuit of justice cannot stop there. Uh, for example, to take an extreme example, it is very nice and reassuring to know that the state or any other individual, uh, any other person would not prevent a destitute from going to Capri or Acapulco to have a good holiday. But the society may have to go a bit beyond securing the individual's right to do what they can do on their own and consider what society or the state can reasonably do to facilitate the freedom of the people to achieve what they have reason to value. It's important not to be restricted by the reading of freedom within institutional libertarianism. If that is important, I go on to argue, then the need to go beyond the mental metrics of utilities in the form of pleasure and desire fulfillment is surely another important issue. The evaluative exercise of taking note of people's actual freedoms cannot be avoided by concentrating instead on some features of mental reaction, whether pleasure or happiness, or on the other side, desire fulfillment, as utilitarian of various kinds, from Jeremy Bentham onwards, uh, via Henry Sidgwick, um, Edgeworth, Pigou, um, uh, to Ramsey, have proposed. John Stuart Mill was the exception to this utilitarian tradition in the sense that he uh, described himself as a utilitarian, but questioned it deeply, mainly because he was much more, in fact, than a utilitarian. I learned from Richard Reeves' excellent biography of John Stuart Mill that Mill was tempted by the narrowly utilitarian view, ignoring everything else, when he was 15. And 15 does seem like a good age to be a dedicated utilitarian. <laughs> <laughs> Even if chronically deprived persons, for example, the hopelessly poor, or the, or the, um, uh, or the long-term unemployed, or subjugated housewives learn to come to terms with and accept cheerfully their deprived lifestyles and the privileged people without hope of liberation often try to do just that to cope with the inescapability of the deprivation involved that cultivated cheerfulness will not eliminate the real deprivation from which they will continue to suffer in pursuing the perspective of freedom, there are, of course, many difficulties to be addressed and problems to be resolved. Um, that is part of the, of the exercise. Freedom has many aspects and many faces, and it is necessary both to distinguish between them and to choose the focus of analysis depending on the nature of the problem that is being addressed. For example, in dealing with the issue of torture, and its unacceptability as a means to other allegedly more important ends pursued in the contemporary world as it happens by many world powers, including some leaders of the global establishment. What would be particularly important is to see the relevance here of the classical libertarian perspective on freedom, like that pursued by John Stuart Mill. And in, in this respect, um, uh, Friedrich Hayek, arguing for the immunity of every human being from forcible infliction of pain and humiliation by others, including the state. This can be partly fitted into the capability perspective, but it greatly predates the modern development of the capability approach, and its concerns go, concerns go well beyond checking who has which capability into the causal influences that leads to capability deprivation in each particular case, giving some special importance to the tyranny uh, of others. The need for and the possibility of integrating liberties 
in this sense with other social priorities, have received a good deal of analytical attention in contemporary social choice theory as well, um, pointing to feasibilities as well as barriers who have to, which have to be overcome. And I think uh, well beyond I was uh, trying to do something with the capability approach in 1971, I published a short paper in Journal of Political Economy, arguing why you may have to go not only against uh, aggregate utilitarianism, but even against the Pareto principle, if you really took liberty seriously. This was in many ways a mistake, even though it was a four-page paper, it immediately generated about 250 papers. And I had to defend myself as well as resist extensions, as well as um, um, various things happened, actually. It, uh, but, um, uh, uh, in, 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 it absorbed a lot of time. I think probably it was worth it. But what I'm emphasizing here is that there's no, uh, there's no <coughs> conflict because by in my interest in, in the in the priority of liberty in some issues, uh, in, in 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 the in the context that would apply even to the theory of justice, and the fact that the capability cannot capture it all doesn't change the story in any way. There's greater relevance of other aspects of freedom when the focus is instead on issues of economic and social disadvantage and advantage, and in general on the inequality of the lives that different people are able or not able to lead in a society. These aspects of freedom can be captured better by a fuller use of the general capability approach, which concentrates on the actual opportunities a person has to do this or be that, things that he or she may value doing or being. Obviously, the things we value most are particularly important for us to be able to achieve. And somehow in, evaluating, in evaluating the capabilities in the form of the sets of alternative um, combinations of functionings that we can have, alternative doings and beings that we can have, in evaluating that, how we value them has to remain um, quite critically important. But the idea of freedom also respects our being free to determine, to, uh, to have to go beyond this, and our being free to determine what we want, what to value, and ultimately what we decide to choose. So in this case, that the, it's not a question that there is no question asked about preferences and valuation. The ability to re-examine preferences, the capability to do that, to learn from surroundings, to be to uh, overcome what Marx called false consciousness or, or, or um, um, objective illusion, in another term Marx used it, which is, uh, could be quite relevant too. Uh, it's easily checked that means such as in, uh, and by the way, Marx thought it mainly in the context of class, but I've tried to argue elsewhere that it applies much more in the case of gender, because people live in the same family. And and uh, a kind of harmonious life requires that you don't talk about conflict, even though you are dealing with a, a situation of cooperative conflict, when cooperation generates benefit, but in a differential way. And it's the, it's the division of div benefit which is really the central issue. And, and uh, you know, mm, people often get this quite wrong in the sense that uh, and, and not just in the context of feminism, but also in globalization, saying that, well, you know, even the poor countries are benefiting. So what's the gumble about? Well, the gumble isn't about that. As, as John Nash noted in a visionary paper in Econometrica in 1950, in fact, his first paper in economics, The Bargaining Problem, uh, that uh, that's true of many circumstances where everyone benefits. The question is, which of these, how, uh, which of these would you choose? How would you benefit? Uh, how would you choose the distribution of benefit? And that applies as much to the issue of globalization as it does to the to the question of men and women in in a family. And indeed, uh, it, uh, the the thought saying that if you don't like, if you think the family, um, I once published a book jointly uh, called the Tyranny of the Family. Um, I guess in America, I might have been linked for that, but because the family values are so extraordinarily important here. But the, um, uh, but, uh, it, it, but the retort that if, if, if women don't like living in families, why don't they live outside? Uh, that's not 
of the issue that's being discussed. The question is, living in a family, there are many alternative divisions. And here it really turns on the freedom of being able to understand what's going on, and that's where the issue of false consciousness comes in, to be able to see that there may be some illusion that the family living has, um, requirement of family living has generated, which one has to go beyond in order to pursue justice uh, in, in this context. It's easily checked that means such as incomes and other resources, while valuable in the pursuit of capabilities, are not themselves indicators, I'm moving to a different subject now, indicators of the capabilities and freedom that people actually have. The ability of a person to convert resources into capabilities depends on a variety of contingent circumstances. For example, the person's biological, physical, and mental characteristic, his or her proneness to illness, the physical, social, an epidemiological environment in which the person lives, and so on. The real opportunities that different persons enjoy are very substantially influenced by variations of individual circumstances. For example, age, disability, proneness to illness, special talents or the absence thereof, gender, maternity, and so on. And also by disparities in the natural and social environment in which people live epidemiological conditions, the extent of pollution around one, around one, the prevalence of local crime. Under these circumstances, an exclusive concentration on inequalities of income distribution cannot be adequate for an understanding of economic inequality. Valuing human freedom differs thus from focusing on income or wealth, which Aristotle had already noted more than 2,000 years ago, uh, referring to wealth, is evidently not the good we are seeking, for it is merely useful and for the sake of something else, unquote. If we focus on freedom, we would, of course, be um, uh, interested, uh, deeply interested in income and wealth as well, inter alia, that persons respectively have and in other such means captured within the broad category of what John Rawls calls primary goods. But ultimately, we have to go beyond that and examine the freedom that people actually do enjoy. Consider an example. Being disabled has a double effect in reducing the person's ability to earn an income, what can be called the earning handicap, and in making the conversion of income into good living that much harder, thanks to the cost of prosthetics and arranging assistance, and of course the impossibility of fully correcting certain types of disadvantages caused by disability, and this can be called conversion handicap. For example, a person who has to be, uh, happens to be, say, crippled by an accident or by illness may need assistance, or a prosthesis, or both, and even then the person would, in all probability, not become as able to move around freely as someone without that disability. The conversion handicap refers to the disadvantage that a disabled person has in converting income into good living, or the freedom of their life. A system of poverty removal that concentrates only on the lowness of income, in particular whether a person's or family income is below the poverty line specified for that society will tax the earning handicap fine, but not the conversion handicap at all. And this could make the poverty relief program fundamentally inadequate and ineffective. Let me illustrate the influence of conversion handicap with some results from a poverty study in the United Kingdom, discussing also the inadequacy of the poverty, um, uh, poverty uh, redressing um, um, arrangements in, in the British society. Uh, the, the results obtained by a brilliant young student at Cambridge called Wibke Kuklis, a German student, um, who at last died tragically shortly after completing her PhD from a virulent type of cancer which gave her no chances at all. In that illuminating PhD thesis, which was published uh, later by the Social Choice and Welfare Society's um, 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 normal publisher, Springer, as a, as a separate book, which I, where I, 
try to write an introduction since she was no longer there. Well, see, I think she saw the, the, the final proof just before she went. If attention is now shifted to individuals and families with a disabled member, sorry, I got it wrong, taking a poverty cutoff line of 60% of the British national medium income, she was working on the picture in 1996-99 in Britain, Cookless found that 17.9%, so 18%, of individuals lived in families with below poverty line income, if you take all the families in Britain. If now attention is shifted to individuals in families with a disabled member, look at only those families, by the way, that's quite high. People don't even recognize one in 10 persons in the world has significant disability. It's about 600 million people in a world of 6 billion. This is World Bank statistics. If attention is, uh, is shifted to that, the percentage of such individuals from disability-affected families living in below poverty line income is 23.1%. So let's say 23%. So it goes up from 18% to 23%, a jump of 5% point, reflecting largely the earning handicap associated with disability of the affected members of the family and the earning disadvantage of others in the family who have to take care of the disabled. If now conversion handicap is introduced, a note is taken, and she, she couldn't, of course, deal with, directly with the capability space. She did what economists often do, looked at um, the income needed, the indirect utility space, as it's sometimes called, what is needed in order to compensate for it. So she looked at the, as a dual, as it were, of that. Um, if that is introduced, a note is taken of the need for more income to ameliorate the disadvantages of disability to the extent it can be ameliorated through prosthesis, through assistance, and other counteracting arrangements. The proportion of individuals in families with disabled members who have thus corrected, um, who live below, who have a family income that is below that corrected income level, taking into account the extra, that goes, from, goes up from 23% to 47.4%, more than 24% point higher than the poverty ratio um, when note is taken only of earning handicap but not of conversion handicap. Indeed, the bulk of the poverty, even in terms of inadequate income, without taking note of any note of the irremediable aspects of capability disadvantage of the disabled turns out to be due to the conversion handicap, going well beyond the earning handicap by four or five times, um, uh, well beyond the earning handicap on which the standard poverty statistics concentrate. This can make the standard poverty relief programs very inadequate, one-sided and unfair, unless we uh, look not just at low income earned, which is the way it all goes, but also at the insufficiency of income to overcome the capability disadvantage related to the conversion <coughs> handicap, that is to bring in the dual space for, for, the, for the extra income needed. And then again, that is an understatement because it doesn't capture the irremediable features of, of the disability that people have. If we were to move beyond the identification and relief of poverty to the assessment of social inequality, the enlightenment provided by the perspective of capabilities can take us well beyond the limited domain of income inequality. We have to take an interest in the overall capabilities that any person enjoys to lead the kind of life she has reason to want to lead. And this requires that attention be paid to her personal as well as environmental characteristics going beyond the income statistics. In the, the nat indeed, I, I would argue the nature of every serious economic and social problem is significantly influenced, or, or, or should be influenced, by taking the importance of freedom and capability seriously, moving away from the primary good space. Let me turn now to the relation between the capability perspective and the importance of education on which there was a certain amount of focus in the conference, and there are a number of interesting and momentous papers in this conference. 
the, our, our ability to do things depend on our education. Sorry, that our ability to do things depend on our education is a point that's not hard to grasp. There are, however, important issues that go, go beyond that fairly straightforward recognition into the complexity of the development of human capability formation, on which, of course, there's very interesting work going on here under the leadership of Jim Heckman. One issue concerns the question, how much of a difference can education make when a child is handicapped in one way or another? Another question relates to the difference that early education, for example, preschool education, can make to what happens later on, what I think Jim calls the, the dynamic aspect. Still, another question concerns the exact role of education among other influences, including nutrition, which also influences physical health and cognitive development. A further question, uh, and by the way, the, uh, in countries like India, this is a very important issue. Nutritional deprivation is a huge reason for cognitive underdevelopment. A further question, and by the way, there too, preschool pre intervention could make a very big difference, and not just school meals and so on. A further question of great significance relates to the contribution of education to emotional development and to the growth of social understanding. This is a general area of huge significance in which the use of capability approach can be potentially extremely important. A big dichotomy in attitudes and beliefs that can be observed relates to the respective roles of nature and nurture in the development of human capabilities. The division between nature and nurture is, of course, ultimately an empirical question, at least empirically informed. But it would be wrong to see it only as an empirical question. Given the complexity and often the undecidability of determining the exact impact of different factors that influence human capabilities, and you know, since there are very little independent measurement of inborn qualities, we have to guess it as a kind of residual, there would tend to remain, at least in the foreseeable future, the need for general arguments and indeed well-informed uh, general assumptions that sort out policy issues even when the empirical questions are not fully resolved. And here we do observe, observe, observe quite a variety of approaches. I shall take the liberty of commenting here on an approach that Adam Smith followed, and which took the form of assuming that there are no differences in natural talents unless there is specific and de definitive evidence in the contrary direction. Indeed, armed with this inclination, Smith actually adjusted his attitude to human potentials in what would look like today as an, in an extremely radical direction. Smith argued, in short, for an almost complete priority of the impact of nurture over nature. And I quote from Smith. Since Smith has such an image, especially in Chicago as a conservative thinker, <laughs> it is quite important to recognize how radical he is. I cut out some of his remarks on race and ethnicity and the pretensions of the white man over Africans in particular, uh, where he argues that there isn't a, if you give to exaggeration, uh, he's using the word Negro, of course, and saying there's not a single Negro anywhere in Africa whose capacity to understand the demands of justice is, is something so complicated that his sordid master is completely incapable of grasping what is being presented. He absolutely loved these sentences. The difference, I quote from Smith, the differences of natural talent in different men is in reality much less than we are aware of. Um, this is Smith. And the very different genius which appears to distinguish men of different professions when grown up to maturity is not upon many occasions so much the cause as the effect of the division of labor. The difference between the most dissimilar characters, between a philosopher and a common street porter, for example, seems to arise not so much from nature as from habit, custom, and education. When they came into the world, and for the first six or eight years of their existence, they were perhaps very much alike, and neither their parents nor playfellows could perceive any remarkable difference. About that age, that is six to eight, 
or soon thereafter, they come to be employed in very different occupations. The difference of talents comes then to be taken notice of and widens by degree, till at last the vanity of the philosopher is willing to acknowledge scarcely any resemblance with the street porter." Unquote. It's easy to see that there can be some real tension here between Smith's firmly articulated view and the existence of genetic differences between one person and another within the same race, or nationality, or class, that modern biology has tended to identify. And one doesn't have to go with Charles Murray to point out that there could be differences here, and which on which there have been lots of scientific work. This could be stochastic, but uh, it could happen. The important point to note here is not only that this epistemic generalization that quoted, uh, what, uh, I quoted from Smith reflects what Smith, on one side, very much wanted to believe, since he was a deep, deeply radical, but also what he thought would be the right uh, um, uh, practical assumption to make when dealing with groups of people without any pre-identified genetic differentiation among people when they are born. It's an argument that will be revisited later in the debate, which included in a different context, in, in the context of utilitarianism between Abelana, Milton Friedman, and I, I joined the debate uh, also. That uh, sometimes when you don't know which way it is, that the right assumption would be that of um, uh, um, insufficient reason for assuming it is much the same. I will not pursue this um, methodological issue further here, but it is important to understand both Smith, Smith's emotional inclination, but more importantly, his well-reflected research strategy in the way his argument tended to proceed. Last year was quite an interesting year because it was the 250th anniversary of the theory of moral sentiments. It was published in 1759. And I, I had the privilege to write a long introduction to the new anniversary edition that Penguin put out. Um, uh, of, of the theory of moral sentiment, and where I discuss, um, well, also the misunderstanding of, um, of Smith that we see all around, and the importance of to recognize how radical a figure he actually was. What is important for Smith, by the way, this is, um, I think it came out in December, but it's by skin of its teeth, it's like 31st of December, it managed to capture the year, which was the 250th anniversary. Largely, it was my fault, of course, as always. <laughs> Maybe I was <laughs> late in delivery, <laughs> but it did just about make it. Mm. What is important for Smith's research agenda is not whether the quoted statement about uniformity of talent of all human beings is literally correct. He often puts in words like perhaps, probably, we can assume, and so on. But whether group differentiation that we see in actual societies, the vast differences that we see, between members of the working class on the one hand and the more privileged, educated, cultivated people on the other with good taste in reading, with music, and so that other, other things reflect differences of natural talents, as many people are inclined to believe, rather than different of education and opportunities to which Smith points and which informs his whole learning analysis in both theory of moral sentiment uh, uh, and, and in the wealth of nations. and, and, and <coughs> And the quotation I gave, I think, is, is, is in fact on the wealth of nations. But it also applies to his posthumously published uh, theory, um, lectures on um, jurisprudence, which were put together by his students from his students' notes. It's not only that, quote unquote, common people have much less opportunity of education and less good ed uh, and less opportunity even further of good education than people of rank and fortune. But Smith puts points also to the fact, and it's a very important fact, that the working life of people itself is a source of cultivation and education. And that differentiates further, as he said in that statement I quoted, what began is a little different, becomes wider and wider. Since our lives are themselves sources of education and capability formation, Smith points here to an enormously important line of research that has not been adequately pursued even now, after a quarter of a millennium. Smith's reasoning focused on the following issues. I quote from Smith again. 
the employments of people of some rank and fortune. Besides, this is, he talks about educational differences first, and now he said, besides that, are seldom such as harass them from morning to night. They generally have a good deal of leisure, during which they may perfect themselves in every branch, either of useful mental knowledge, of which they may have laid the foundation, or for which they may have a foundation in school, or for which they may have acquired some taste in the earlier part of their life, including their working lives. It is otherwise with the common people. They have little time to spare for education. Their parents can scarce afford to maintain them, even in infancy. As soon as they are able to work, they must apply to some trade by which they can earn their subsistence. That trade, too, is generally so simple and uniform as to give little exercise to the understanding, uh, while at the same time, to their understanding, as well as while at the same time their labor is both so constant and so severe that it leaves them little time, leisure, and less inclination to apply to and even to think of anything else." Unquote. Reasoning in this line, Smith notes that the system of division of labor, which as it happens, he definitively analyzed, I mean, this is a big thing, I mean, his big contribution was that, and indeed the novel that um, Paul Krugman got two years ago, in many ways, is the development of the Smithian mind of reasoning, uh, discussing how competitive market equilibrium uh, with, uh, with constant returns to scale may not be the best way of understanding it, and why the mathematical problems, which are quite considerable, can be dealt with, which Paul did. Um, but it is very much on the Smithian line. Um, now, so he is a great champion of the division of labor, because it's hugely beneficial in raising productivity and our, uh, our income, in advancing trade and enhancing living standards to people. But he goes on to note that, on the other hand, the effect of uh, division of labor is to diminish the reach of human talents and freedoms for the majority of people, for the working classes. He analyzes the nasty implication, and, and he's concerned very much about that. And he thinks, of course, uh, again, a uh, thought that is not often recognized, that while you have to cultivate markets, the state has a huge role to play to, to, to to negate these inequalities that generate from what is otherwise a productive system. Um, he analyzes this nasty implication of division of labor in considerable detail and eloquent in drawing attention to how much a narrowing of the human mind it e yields. I quote from Smith again, I have seen several boys under 20 years of age who have never exercised any other trade but that of making nails, unquote. A humane public policy has to take note both of the positive and negative features of division of labor, and of course, do what it can expand to expand uh, to uh, what it can to expand the reach of education. This argument fits into Smith's general advocacy of public education to reverse the neglect of native talents that seem to him to be a uniform feature uh, of all societies, and which was very urgently in need of remedy. While it's important to understand Smith's inclination, indeed longing, to believe in the equal potentials of all human beings, what is crucial to his policy prescription is his pointer to the uniformity of the neglect of human talent, to the lack of education, and the unimaginative nature of the work that many people are forced to do. Class divisions reflect this inequality of opportunity, Smith argued, rather than being the result of differences of inborn talents and abilities, as many of his contemporaries tended explicitly or implication to believe. I must stop here, since I have run out of the half an hour that was allocated to me. Uh, I think I seem to have done more, but I think we began late, too. I think. <laughs> no, no, I think we can come back to it. Um, um, but I uh, look forward to the Q&A. I hope to be able. I hope to have been able to point to some of the huge issues of social understanding and policy making that can be enriched by reason and reasonable use of the capability perspective. This is because an adequate understanding of the relevant role and reach of freedom and capabilities is central to the assessment 
of justice and injustice in the society. This is an area of human knowledge on which I've argued there is much to do still. Thank you. Do you want to call on people yourself or shall I call on you? Um, well, I, I don't know. I think um, you, given my eyesight at the moment, you may be able, better able. Okay, I'll call on people. I don't want to uh, we, we have catch good. people and oblige people. We have, I would say, about 15, 20 minutes. I don't want to catch people who are scratching their ears. So <laughs> <laughs> force them to ask a question. No one seems to be scratching their ears at this moment. I couldn't have been that convincing. Yes. Uh, during your talk this morning, or during a comment, you said that the oper uh, operationalization uh, uh, of the capabilities of oceans chills your bones. Uh, no. Quote, right? no. I said the concentration on that problem. The concentration. Just my bones. On opera was, okay. Uh, because, you know, there are. I just want you to expand on what. No, but you ask your question. Why don't you ask your question? Assume well, that's what I said. But then what would you have then said? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe you could expand why there's too much concentration on yeah. the opera. Oh, why there is, I don't know. That's a causal thing. But why do I think that there is? Yes, right. Yeah. Um, well, because of two different reasons. One is that quite a lot of the, um, the importance of the capability thing is to recognize problems, like Smith's thing, that much of the inequality in the world that we observe is not connected with inborn talents at all, but it's connected with um, with how people are educated and indeed their working life, which is also a source of education. Now, to many people, this would look not an operationalized argument. Of course, you know, what percentage can you tell us? What's the impact, etc.? I think the most important thing is to recognize that that is indeed the case. And I think that's making a huge thing. As I tried to say, in, uh, I think in the morning, or maybe I'm imagining, I've just given five lectures in Chicago so far, so I'm not <laughs> sure which one was given where. But, um, you know, it's like saying, if you're reading a book like Mill's On Liberty, it's like saying, look, come off it, and Mill, I mean, you know, tell us, uh, tell us how you're going to measure liberty and operationalize it. But that's not what the book is about. It is the pointing out a very important neglect which has to be remedied, no matter how. Now, the second issue is that operationalization is inescapably uh, an art of the possible and the art of what is contextually needed. And that would mean you will not get one operationalized thing. Now, whether there is sufficient uniformity in the world to have a list of capabilities that may be relevant for, uh, as Martha discusses, not inequality in general, but poverty particularly, the deprivation aspect, is a different question. We could debate on that empirically. But I think the issues vary a lot depending on what stage of development you are in, what are the priorities at that moment, and so forth. And it also depends on uh, concerns about what is available, what is not. I mean, when uh, you, you quite often, I think the kind of work that say, Whipke Cook, Cook listed, which I was quoting, didn't take sufficient note of the conversion handicap since it dealt with the indirect capability space, as it were, namely the income space to what extent that is needed. But then again, even with the, all the prosthetics and all the help, you're still not the same if you're crippled as an uncrippled person who can walk around freely without that. So then to say, look, this doesn't work. No, and someday one hopes that one will get a better way of getting at it. But I think the reason why Wibke Crisler's work is still a hugely important contribution to understanding of capability and poverty in general and to a particular critique of the British anti-poverty program, uh, on the other hand, uh, it, I think to recognize that doesn't indicate that this is the, the last word. It is operationalized, but somebody could say, I could do a better way of operationalizing. Whether or not it can be done becomes a relevant question there, too. So I think if we recognize the contingency and context dependence of operationalization, and the fact that what is captured by operationalization is only a part of the thing. I think the basic issue is understanding what's going on. And 
operationalization, the demands of operationalization, can uh, divert people from, uh, from uh, asking questions that cannot be at an operational level um, um, answered at that moment. Mill could not have given you a good index of liberty at that time by which you could say that you know, the German society has more liberty or less liberty than France and so on. But he was pointing to a very important issue. I don't want to stifle them. So it is the over-concentration on operationalization and its context and the pursuit of context-independent operationalization about which I was slightly grumbling. Okay. Marcus, um, yeah. but, but in your newest book, can we see your focus on you know, saying we should look less at what makes a just the perfect ideal just institution and more at de deciding what are clearly areas that are unjust and trying to fix them, isn't that focusing more on oper 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 <laughs> operationalization? So that's one part of the question. But the other one is, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I recall that in the book, you actually point to one example of clear, uh, of clear injustice today, the access to medicines issue. Uh, well, I do many, but that's one of them. Okay, okay. About okay. 10 or 11, yeah. Uh, okay, well, I wanted to know, uh, one, the broader question about, uh, are you really actually thinking about oper operationalization in the book? But two, thinking about access to medicines, and here in the context of um, education, a very practical question in some sense is, uh, do you see access to educational textbooks uh, as just as important, and, and what is your position on that? Well, I think... Um, the issue I'm trying to make is about, uh, the point I was trying to make the social choice, uh, about social contract approach. I think you can talk in terms of operationalization, but that's a very narrow framework to bring in. And uh, I think in terms of practical reason, and after all, it is not pure reason and practical reason. And the question arises, I mean, there is a decisional context, which of course can't make quite clear. And and this applies to human rights thing. All the debates about human rights, can you actually be sure? Would, be, would there be enough of an agreement on what are human rights? And therefore the whole subject is rubbish. It ended up in a situation where it is very counterproductive. You have to emphasize many things. Border disputes take up a huge amount of time. It's exactly like an analogy saying, look, you keep talking about China and India. But that is not a well-defined concept that they haven't yet settled the dispute around the border in McMahon line. We don't know where China begins and India ends. Can you give me a criteria by which you know exactly whether you're in China or in, in India in an operationalizable way? And if I said, look, I, I can't, and I think this will remain an ambiguity, but nevertheless, talking about China and India is not a waste of time. Uh, there's lots of things you can understand with that talk which you can't otherwise. So I think it's a question of the priority of the concept and understanding. And then, yes, operationalization. And that's why I go to the examples, too, in, in the context of today. And I also discuss how it's moved. Uh, the um, Condorcet and, 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 and Smith and uh, Wollstonecraft may concentrate on slavery, but not the freedom of unionization uh, or, and, and, and collectivity and so on. But then, of course, once slavery is abolished, at least in parts of the world, uh, then it becomes relevant to ask further questions. And then the focus of operationalization changes. And I was partly also pointing to the context dependence of the operationalization exercise that would be relevant. But it wouldn't be if you put operationalization first, rather than the understanding <laughs> of the problem first. And then the operationalization follows from it contingently and uh, in terms of um, uh, the art of the possible, what can be done and what cannot be done. So I think that's the way I would tend to uh, think um, uh, of, of that issue. And then there will be boundaries on which we will not be even, for example, uh, I don't, I mean, one reason why I believe that we will not all agree uh, on liberty and, and the importance of relative liberty, uh, relative importance of liberty on one side and uh, economic inequality on the other. Now, I think, again, an operational framework with all these will want them to be all properly weighted out. I don't think we have to do that. And, you know, it's not a, it's not a, 
if not even a, an absence of operationalization, to say that you can deal with a partial ordering, where by some questions you can resolve and others you can't. Some people would, I mean, I attach importance to both. And I do think that Bob Nozick, my friend with whom I taught, I was very close friend, and with whom I taught 10 years in a class, I did think that you get more focus on liberty and on, 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 on in economic uh, inequality in a way that wasn't justifiable. I thought in some way that was also Herbert Hart's criticism of Rawls. Why should liberty have a complete priority? Now, I think, as I argued in the morning, Rawls was not only right, but actually really visionary to separate out liberty as a part of his requirement of the theory of justice. And he was right to begin there, too. And yet, I think he ends up by giving lexicographic priority, ending giving more room to that than I would argue it should be given. And then, but then there are economic egalitarians who actually would not see anything uh, in that. And I, I was also mentioning that even my friend Ronald Dawkins, with whom I also taught classes for 10 years in Oxford, as it happened, um, I mean, I don't begin to see how equality of, uh, equality of resources by a counterfactual insurance market. And of course, Ronnie, like many other non-economists, takes the market very seriously, as if the equilibria always exist, and they're unique, and they're easily convertible into. Uh, and this insurance market, this you know, famous territory of asymmetric information, but uh, there's a certain amount of naivety in assuming that this could do all that. But quite aside from that, what happened to liberty? And, and I think that becomes and, you know, we will continue to disagree on that. But that doesn't matter. It's quite important. Uh, I mean, it would be nice if we all agreed, but exactly on the relative weight. But it's very important to recognize that each of these have importance. We may disagree on the extent to it. One of my first papers in Econometrica, it wasn't really my first paper, but a couple of papers were in majority decision and domain condition, but my, my, then in, the, in 1970, I think I've published a paper on exactly that, when you have a how you could generate a partial ordering when the weights are not specified and you get, there's some mathematical complexity involved, but you get certain regularity properties which have been part of the standard maths of, of earlier period. I mean, one of the big things that was happening then, and it's very important for us to bear in mind operationalization context, because like a lot of economics, which had been guided by physics, and Newtonian mechanics and that, it assumes a level of precision, which uh, is not very appropriate for uh, social variables and not particularly needed either. You have partial ordering. When Bourbaki's famous book on maths and general topology and set theory, these two books come, the initial, the, the basic ordering is what he calls a pre-ordering, which is an incomplete ordering. That's the basic relation. Then completeness is special assumption that comes in. I think that was a much more uh, um, useful framework. Similarly, other things with mathematicians were also doing, and some economists involved in it too, namely fuzzy sets and fuzzy <coughs> preferences. Social choice theory had quite a bit on that. Canaro and Suzumura and I were in our handbook of social choice theory whole chapter on these fuzzy relations and the importance of them in the social context. But these are part of pure maths of a very different kind. In fact, oddities I found since I came in Trinity, which is very much a mathematician's college, the distinction is between pure and applied math. And applied math is all mainly physics. And it turned out that the thing that is most aptly careful, usually, is kind of math which is not that of physics, but which was put under pure math, pure math, like topology and so forth. And that, of course, was a big change that was happening in economics also beginning with the, with, uh, with the work of Canaro, Gerard, Gerard Dubrow, and then so on. So it's that, and operationalization as it stands is, a, is, is really pretty captured by the predominance of the, uh, you know, of the, uh, of the um, um, physics-related math. As it were. I might say, by the way, Trinity now has three themes. That is pure math, applied math, and applicable maths. <laughs> That's a huge compromise, but we've always believed on that compromise, that kind of thing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wish you could, I wonder if you could clarify something that came up a bit uh, this morning. And, yeah. Uh, I think it's a, it's a question that many people have about the capability of work. It's a very basic question. I, I understand 
your desire to go away from a pure utilitarian criteria. So you don't want to rely on preferences. And your example of somebody who gets used to a bad way of life is a very good example. But I, I worry that the capability set itself is generated by an implicit set of preferences. And that out there, we're sort of trading one set of preferences for another that's less explicit. So I'm sure you've encountered this question on repeated occasions. But in some sense, defining what's a good and what's a bad, yeah. what, what should be considered a capability or not, involves some kind of implicit valuation. Maybe not from the agent himself or herself, but from some third party. So the question is, where does that, so, so there's not a uniqueness uh, question. I mean, there's, I mean, there's not a unique agreement on what a capability set would be, especially yeah. when we trade off components like liberty versus economic freedom and various kinds of yeah. other things. So, I wonder how you would respond to that comment. Yeah. Um, the, I think there's three things to say on that. It's a very interesting question. One is that the part of the problem arises from the use of the word preference to mean very many different things. Uh, and when I did a, a paper called Rational Fools, which was published a long time ago, it's difficult to think now. It's like uh, 35 years ago, something like that. Um, the complaint was that the preference can, is used in so many different things. They're not the same. And if you use the same word, by definition, by construction, you make them the same. But that's an empirical assumption. There's your con concept of your own well-being, your concept of your interests, your concept of your goals, your concept of your values, which may go beyond goals. You might give room to others in the pursuit of their goals, even though it requires you to go beyond your own goals because you accept some need for restraint in living in a society. Now, all these could be called preferences, if you like, but they're not the same. And the utilitarians tended to use one particular use they use the word preference. Whenever you raise a question, they say, oh, you can put it into the preference. That's no problem. Um, but the only thing is, by the time you've done that, you don't have the pre-chosen meaning of preference in terms of, you know, take Pareto optimality. That is about individual well-being. And that meaning has gone if the priority is not about that. And it's a, it's a very relevant question. I mean, in the... In the um, No, it's not a, no, but, it, 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 but uh, Jim, that's not the only issue, though. By the way, this is only my first of three points, and I'll come to the other. <laughs> yeah, but the, but, the, but the preference, you can put anything you like in it, but it will be, then it's changing its meaning. And our values are very important, ultimately. And, and our goals are different, but goals need not be the same as self-interest. Now, this is a big subject of debate, of course, within law and economics, and of course, as it happens, uh, the one of the oddities, I, I teach a class at, uh, with a brilliant um, legal uh, um, uh, theorist who was originally trained as economist, Christine Jones, who is a professor at Yale Law School, jointly offered in Yale and, and Harvard on, on rationality and choice. And of course, it's quite clear that rational choice theory is having quite a tough time now in terms of um, um, experimental uh, economics and and the and the and behavioral economics that such people don't seem to behave like that, and yet the interpretational issue is not sufficiently engaged, I think, in behavioral economics yet, and that remains a big thing. The disinclination to go into the interpretational question, which to me is central, is extremely important. There are things we agree to do, which is our preference. Any interest in news, and they will end up believing that. Obama wants to send everyone's grandmother to, 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 <laughs> to, to, to oblivion, uh, that he would otherwise, like he should be at the New York Times, and he suggests, looking at you, saying, you know, I can't play the game very well, because, you know, that light is distracting me. Do you mind putting the window shade down? Now, your thought is that you should rather give him the New York Times, but... Uh, <laughs> You think, A, he wouldn't like it. And B, you ask yourself, you happen to have control over the window shade because you have that seat. On the other hand, um, uh, you know, you shouldn't do it in a way that goes against what this guy is trying to do. <coughs> that doesn't mean it's not even part of your goal to make him play the game. It's not a goal at all. It is that you're following a, a self-imposed constraint that you don't impose your own goals on your behavior. Now, of course, every in a mathematical form, 
every constraint can be through Lagrangian multiplier seen as an as if preference, but that's not the same thing as, as real preference, it's just a representational device. So I think there are all kinds of ways that there are things we do with which preference have to be concerned, which do, may not reflect not even your not only your not your self-interest, but not even your old goals because you accept certain good rules of behavior in dealing with living with others in a society. So in so the the, the, the first is, issue is the the interpretation of preference in utilitarianism is a very narrow one, uh, but then they use this to include everything under preference and buy what is, after all, a gigantic fund, cover every factor, because they already have a term preference, which is so versatile that it can include everything, and at the same time, then you can end up interpreting it at your interest and well-being. And to some extent, that happens, I think. Um, I don't know whether Gary is coming tomorrow, but that's one of our, if not, okay. One of my ongoing arguments with Gary, Gary Becker. But the second, uh, the second uh, uh, issue uh, is this, that the, that the preference, several all these problems went away. Preference is not going to give you interpersonal comparisons. Because, you know, except in an exercise of imagination, um, as imagined by, by Hassani or Vikri, you're not considering being somebody else. So your preference is telling you what you would like yourself. It doesn't tell you how the deprivation of a person. I mean, there is no question that if I am a, 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 an, um, um, a, a, a subjugated housewife, I'm better off, and I might prefer, if I see no hope at all of changing that, to take some pleasure in this, rather than mourning all the time. So as a living strategy, it makes a good deal of sense for me to, to create some happiness in my life if I, if I think the situation is hopeless, which is true of most many inequalities in the world. But that, the relevance of it isn't that that is a bad reflection of your preferences, even of what should count in your capability, in your capability. What it is bad at is comparing your deprivation with that of the other. The preference information gives you nothing at all on that in terms of actual choices that are observed. That's a completely different territory. Preference has nothing to say on this subject. And I think that is a point which is not often recognized because unlike classical utilitarianism, which was concerned with comparison of happiness, and I don't have great problem with that, or in a Ramsian form, comparison of fulfillment of desires, comparing by the strength of their desires, a little shadier, but at least I understand what that is. Simple preference, as revealed in market, is not telling anything at all about interpersonal comparison. That's a huge thing. Given the amount of time I'm taking, I'll stop at these two points rather than go on to the third. <laughs> Why don't we take two? Yeah, let's take two. Okay. Well, Dasha and Adam will take. Oh, okay. First, Dasha. Sorry, I said no. I don't. Oh, have so you don't. You know, no. So you don't want to. Okay. I want to return to your beautiful observation this morning about the obligations that might arise from having uh, lots of capabilities, from having a very large capability set. Uh, you suggested uh, you had the the metaphor of the, the mother with the child. Uh, and the mother has an obligation for the child because of her capacity to, uh, to care for the child. We have focused largely uh, today on kind of education within a domestic context, uh, within a familial context, within the, you know, within the, uh, uh, the nation state system. Yeah. Um, but we haven't looked uh, at the possibility of transnational kind of uh, approaches to uh, education. Is there a role? For, um, for countries or people who have great capacity or capabilities mm -hmm. to, to assist in education without being paternalistic in doing so, uh, in, in, in assist in education elsewhere in places that are, are greater deprivation. Yeah, I think paternalism is a big subject. I don't want to enter into it. Um, and, uh, you know, Christine and I spent the, uh, one day, I think, for. We do it since at Yale and Harvard together, Yale Law School and Harvard, 
together. And Yale students are bussed into Harvard. Instead of making them come every week for two hours, we do every fortnight, two, two hours, four hours. So it's an all-day exercise for them. So one of them, one of the days we spent on things like Cass's, uh, Kassenstein's nudge and, and other things about how to be paternalistic without violating uh, liberalism and so on. I think there's a big lot of problems, and, and we can discuss that. But I don't want to enter in that territory, because that's not, I think, what you're really basically seeking. Um, because your paternalism comes in only very passing. But I'm saying I'm not saying anything on the paternalism issue. It requires much greater engagement. But the, on the subject of um, what it is all beyond your border, one of the differences, you see, the, uh, between the approach I'm trying to present and that of the social contract theory is that it can easily be global. If you take a statement like Sir Martin Luther King saying that uh, um, 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 injustice anywhere in the world is a threat to justice everywhere in the world, uh, that makes no sense. In fact, Tom Nagel, you can't think of a smarter and a more humane philosopher than Tom. Uh, and one of my closest friends from his work, I learned a lot in an incredible paper, argues against which actually <laughs> I think <laughs> Josh has a paper too, arguing why the idea of global justice is a chimera. Why? Because you, there's no global state. What are you talking about? Now, that of course is the way of social contract theory in that form does. And uh, it, it's a question which I don't want to go into here as to some halfway houses like contractualism of Tim Scanlon, how much can it cover or, or not cover on that. I'm quite skeptical of that too, though Skim, Tim and I have a lot of points in common and I've learned a great deal again from his work. But the, the real issue is that a lot of the ethical debates in the world are exactly of the kind that people were raising in 18th century. Indeed, they were raising that. When Mary Wilson Clark said, Surprisingly, since it's known that she wrote her second book attacking uh, Edmund Burke's attitude to the French Revolution for not supporting it, that the first book, Vindication of the Rights of Men, which people don't read much, uh, it quite a lot is about slavery. And there he attacks, she attacks um, 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 Edmund Burke for supporting the American Declaration of Independence and even had this mysterious statement which I first encountered, I found very puzzling, on what grounds Mr. Burke could support the American Declaration of Independence is beyond me to fathom. What is this revolutionary English woman talking about? Well, she's talking about is slavery, namely that you cannot make a statement about freedom of some people, not of others. And the time to engage in it was right then and right there. Now, these are all international issues that are being considered. Uh, Tom Paine's discussion has a lot of that, too, even though his concentration is national. And as Garrett Stedman Jones' beautiful analysis showed, that this very abstract discussion of Tom Paine played a hugely important part in the emergence of poverty relief programs institutionally in the United States um, many, many decades, indeed, century later. So I think that... Um, plasticity of, 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 of going beyond borders is present in the, uh, the alternative approach, which I'm calling the social choice approach, to this, to this broadly these people uh, fitted in. And the human rights literature is part of that exercise. It's not that human rights are legal rights, which Bentham thought is the only kind of right, but that's just a confusion. Nor is it that human rights uh, can be discussed only when they're realizable, as some people like Cranston did, and to some extent in a brilliant argument otherwise, Honora O'Neill does. Because part of the object of recognizing something as human rights is to agitate, to make them feasible rights. The fact that they're not feasible already doesn't stop the engagement of human rights, because part of the invitation of human rights is for fresh legislation, as well as fresh practices. And Mary Wilson Clark discusses that, and indeed, in a very visionary way, one of the reasons why I think she's unfortunately the most neglected author of the, of the 18th century philosopher, is where she said that, but you're not going to be able to remedy this by legislation alone. Attitude to women is a matter for public discussion, debate, media criticism, literature, everything. 
So it's that generic view which is there. Now, the connection with Sutta Nipata and Buddha, and when I quoted the fact that Buddha gives an analogy, this is not so much about uh, many capabilities, etc. It's just that there Buddha is arguing that you don't have to argue from, an ad, from a mutual advantage in cooperation, which in a sense is very deep in the social contract approach. You don't have to argue for it. If you are able to do something which you recognize as good, you have an obligation to do it. There's, a, there's some kind of a schizophrenia. If you recognize it, it would be better if it's done. And at the same time, you don't have to do anything about it. What do you mean then it's better? So that's the question that comes up. And you could debate, obviously, on that too. And the human rights are a lot, is a statement of that kind. These are ethical statements which might, as um, um, Declaration of Human Rights by, um, um, by, um, uh, by the United Nations in, in, in 1944, which Eleanor Roosevelt uh, pioneered, it was very much her hope uh, that that will serve as a model for legislation elsewhere. And indeed, European Declaration of Human Rights and the Court of Human Rights would not have come but for that. So there are all kinds of ways in which to make not yet feasible rights feasible, the human rights may be a very important way of thinking about it. And that's not a contract area, not a mutual advantage thing. Not that we do this for the Sudanese women ter terrorized by men, but uh, we do this because that is important and we can do something about it. And it's not the question that we expect Sudanese women to do something for uh, American women who are agitating on that on, as a part of the global feminist movement. I think it's that kind of question for which the Buddha statement, I think, is very relevant. Thank, thank you very, very much.